and greetings. Happy Monday. It's been a minute, but we are back. My name's Steve Dace, in case you had forgotten. His name's Todd Erzin. His name's Aaron McIntyre. I mean, Todd had to wear my my swag to remember my name. It's been a minute since we've seen each other. I went into my closet. I said, what is this? Who is this guy? Yeah, who, who, who do I work for again? Oh, yeah, that guy. Yes. Is it Deese? What, how is it pronounced? Yes. So before we get into everything else, let me just say that uh, I I can't even tell you guys how encouraging it was, um, how supportive it was, how much love I felt from all of you guys. I mean, the amount of emails I received, uh, social media interactions I received these last couple of weeks of support, uh, prayerful support, emotional support. Um, I, I can't keep up with all of the, all of the feedback on nefarious. Uh, I had to just create an entire new file in my inbox and I'm going to keep all of them and treasure them forever. I, I can't even respond to all of them anymore. I've gotten so many and, uh, and then uh, the reaction to the podcast I did last Monday before I shut it down for a week. Um, I'm very blessed and I'm very thankful. And uh, I just want to say collectively to all of you, I love you too and thank you. I mean, I, I don't, I can't put it any simpler or better than that. It was just, uh, it was just absolute fuel to get me back and, and ready to come back here today and get back into the battle. So thank you. A lot of you have questions. I'm guessing when we get to ask me anything next hour, we're going to get a lot of questions along this regard. Some of the themes that, uh, themes that we addressed in last Monday's podcast, things like apostles and not assassins, what do those things mean? And I think we're going to we're going to work those things out together as we move forward. But I, over the last week, I've had a lot of time to contemplate what does that mean? And here's one thing that I have determined and decided, and I, I want to share it with you guys before we get going with regular order here on the show. The, the prime directive of this program has always been the advancement and promotion of a biblical worldview. For example, today I'm wearing a t-shirt, not just any t-shirt, MVCS. This is the official mascot logo for Mid-Vermont Christian School. And if you remember them a couple of months ago, they went all in. They risked everything to stand against this tranny madness happening in the culture. And that girl's basketball team got decertified by the Vermont High School Athletic Union. They risked everything. And the enemy punched him right in the mouth. They didn't back down. They didn't play victim. They counted it all joy to suffer for the name. And so earlier this year when they were having a fundraiser, I made sure to promote it on my socials, went and bought with a nice donation, went and bought one of their shirts, and I thought it was the perfect shirt to wear as we come back to the battle today. Is to is 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 a reminder of ultimately whom we serve and what the cause is. We're not trying to save America. We're trying to save Americans. And I think we need to be even more intentional about imposing a biblical worldview into the show. I think, and, and I've been thinking this since the last election, I, I just think traditional political analysis is a loss leader. It's a waste of time. 
We're, we're dealing now with forces beyond metrics and rubrics and logic. And we're sitting here on the owner's manual to the universe. And we're, we're pretty aggressive about opening it here on this show. But we're going to be even more intentional. I think it is, it's time for... Maybe more of a Francis Schaeffer kind of approach to where we are. Where we literally take everything, every day, purposefully, that we talk about. That Aaron feeds us with his incredible montages. <clears throat> both incredible in their quality and often tragedy. <laughs> and we filter them even more purposefully through a biblical worldview. Because I think that's maybe the only way to truly understand the signs of the times and what to do about them. So that's one way. Maybe that'll be the main way. I don't know. But that is, that is something I have thought a lot about. A lot of you, I'm sure, have questions about. That is something I have thought a lot about in the week since I posted that very personal podcast. So without further ado, let's put it to the test. Here's Aaron's rundown of what happened while we were away. What happened while we were away brought to you by a top five stories of the past week and a couple more. We were gone for about six broadcast days, so I decided to take a stab at what were the top five stories since we've been gone. Number five, Fauci admits masks don't work. Several Branch Covidian high priests and priestesses have been on a gaslighting tour as of late, and it's not a surprise they feel no shame whatsoever, which is why people like Teachers Union Grand Poobah Randy Weingarten has even fashioned her herself as a champion of reopening schools in recent months. But no one takes the cake better than the chief public health forked tonguesman, Anthony Fauci. And nowhere is this more apparent than in his interview with the New York Times last week, in which he admitted masks don't work. He told the paper, quote, from a broad public health standpoint at the population level, masks work at the margins, maybe 10 percent. By the way, just as a reminder, here's what Fauci said prior to the pandemic being, well, the pandemic. Right now in the United States, people should not be walking around with masks. You're sure of it? Because people are listening really no, closely to this. Uh, right now, people should not be walking. There's no reason to be walking around with a mask. And here's what Fauci said about masks a few months in. Contrary to what we thought, masks really do work. Number four, the 2024 primary episode five, Republicrats strike back. Former Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson announced he's running for president last week. <laughs> He, businessman Vivek Ramaswamy and former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley have all come out in lockstep with Donald Trump defending the poor old woke groomers at Disney against Ron DeSantis. Nowhere was this more apparent than with the aforementioned Nikki Haley and her interview with Fox News, where she welcomed the woke company with open arms to South Carolina to pollute the ideological water table there. You know, as governor, I took a double digit unemployment state and I turned it into an economic powerhouse. Businesses were my partners. Because if you take care of your businesses, you take care of your economy, your economy takes care of the people and everyone wins. And so that's the way we dealt with it. We are, South Carolina was a very anti-woke state. It still is. And if Disney would like to move their hundreds of thousands of jobs to South Carolina and bring the billions of dollars with them, I'll let them know. I'll be happy to meet them in South Carolina and introduce them to the governor and the legislature that would, that would welcome it. Nothing says standing up to woke companies like welcoming them to your state with open arms. Number three, Joe Biden is running in 2024. Joe Biden says he wants to, quote unquote, finish the job. But you know, around the country, MAGA extremists are lining up to take on those bedrock freedoms. Cutting Social Security that you've paid for your entire life while cutting taxes for the very wealthy. Dictating what health care decisions women can make. Banning books and telling people who they can love all while making it more difficult for you to be able to vote. President Dementia will indeed seek the Democrat nomination for president in 2024. A couple of recent national polls, so take that with a grain of salt, shows Robert F. Kennedy Jr. bringing in about 20 percent. 
Number two, sprinting towards Venezuela. According to a Reuters report last week, the Chinese yuan became the most widely used currency for cross-border transactions in China in March, overtaking the dollar for the first time. That's according to official data. Reflecting those efforts from Beijing to internationalize use of the yuan and de-dollarize. Of course, the Shycoms are liars, but it's a development that would not be surprising if true. Meanwhile, stagflation worries are starting to seep into Wall Street. The first First quarter GDP results were about half of what was expected as the economy grew at 1.1% versus an expected 2%. Still unusually high inflation coupled with the Federal Reserve's interest rate hikes and potentially more to come. Along with efforts to de-dollarize across the world could mean the U.S. is sprinting towards a Venezuela-like future. And no, that's not sensationalism. In number one, Fox News parts way with Tucker Carlson. Tucker Carlson is no more at Fox News. The company announced in a press release last Monday, Carlson and Fox had agreed to part ways. His last show was Friday, the 21st of April. A couple of days after his ouster, Carlson posted this video to social media. The other thing you notice when you take a little time off is how unbelievably stupid most of the debates you see on television are. They're completely irrelevant. They mean nothing. In five years, we won't even remember that we had them. Trust me, as someone who's participated. And yet at the same time, and this is the amazing thing, the undeniably big topics, the ones that will define our future, get virtually no discussion at all. War, civil liberties, emerging science, demographic change, corporate power, natural resources. When was the last time you heard a legitimate debate about any of those issues? It's been a long time. Debates like that are not permitted in American media. Both political parties and their donors have reached consensus on what benefits them, and they actively collude to shut down any conversation about it. Suddenly, the United States looks very much like a one-party state. That's a depressing realization, but it's not permanent. Our current orthodoxies won't last. They're brain dead. Nobody actually believes them. Hardly anyone's life is improved by them. This moment is too inherently ridiculous to continue, and so it won't. The people in charge know this. That's why they're hysterical and aggressive. They're afraid. They've given up persuasion. They're resorting to force. But it won't work. When honest people say what's true, calmly and without embarrassment, they become powerful. At the same time, the liars who've been trying to silence them shrink and they become weaker. That's the iron law of the universe. True things prevail. Where can you still find Americans saying true things? There aren't many places left, but there are some, and that's enough. As long as you can hear the words, there is hope. Carlson's show, of course, was the highest rated on Fox and in all of cable news and was easily the biggest cash cow for the network as Carlson's monologues were routinely, if not nightly, in and of themselves newsworthy. A couple other tidbits. ABC News conducted an interview with Democrat presidential hopeful Robert F. Kennedy Jr. And of course, the interview covered his thoughts about vaccines. At the end of the interview, however, ABC made this stunning but not surprising admission. We should note that during our conversation, Kennedy made false claims about the COVID-19 vaccines. Data shows that the COVID-19 vaccines prevented millions of hospitalizations and deaths from the disease. He also made misleading claims about the relationship between vaccination and autism. Research shows that vaccines and the ingredients used for the vaccines do not cause autism, including multiple studies involving more than a million children and major medical associations like the American Academy of Pediatrics and the advocacy group autism speaks we've used our editorial judgment in not including extended portions of that exchange in our interview we thank mr kennedy for the conversation so yes in the interest of full disclosure ABC News decided not to disclose everything. Also, a new exclusive report from the Wall Street Journal claims current CIA director William Burns, Goldman Sachs chief legal officer Catherine Rumler, popular communist academic Noah Chomsky, Obama administration officials and others met with sex offender Jeffrey Epstein in the years after his conviction. The revelations are based on Epstein's private calendar, which was leaked to the Wall Street Journal. The journal could not prove whether the meetings ever did indeed take place. And finally, Finally, one mini montage to rule them all, courtesy of Milk Bar TV on Twitter, featuring Australian Sky News anchor Sherry Markson, who you may remember, by the way, produced that explosive documentary a couple of years ago about the Wuhan lab. She was also totally on board, apparently, with jab mandates. Here's the how it started, how it's going montage to rule them all. Mandating vaccines 
like this, like they're doing in France to enable them to open up is a very sensible approach. The federal government is paying compensation to hundreds of Australians who have vaccine injuries from the COVID jab. If you're a customer going into a store, you want to know that the people working there are vaccinated. Some of the COVID injuries include life altering heart inflammation. If you're in a restaurant, you wanna know that the people sitting alongside you, breathing in the same air as you, have also been vaccinated, damaged capillaries and autoimmune disorders. And I hope my company, News Corp, mandates vaccines for employees. There are also thousands who've applied for compensation and are waiting to hear back. Joining me now to discuss is former Deputy Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Nick Coatesworth. Nick, great to see you. You know, the, I, I suspect the majority of Australians will get vaccinated and there, and there will be a strong um, public view um, that those who choose not to get vaccinated um, uh, need to um, uh, there needs to be some sort of um, in incentive stick, perhaps, um, through the current programs, including no jab, no pay. And we need to crack on and get those, uh, get those uh, claims assessed. There's no reason in 2023 that we shouldn't have that all done. Yeah, and there are thousands who say that uh, they are waiting to hear whether their request for compensation has been approved. Mandating vaccines is a very sensible approach. And that's what happened while we were away. When we were writing Rise of the Fourth Reich, we had set aside to do a chapter with Sherry Markson. Remember, we had her on this show yeah. after she talked, she did the outstanding book on what happened in that Wuhan lab. And we just continually got no reply. I just thought that was very odd. But we just had so many other people to talk to. We were already approaching 400 pages of a book. You know, at some point you have to put it to bed. You know, you're not writing the, uh, the, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Although maybe we were. Uh, but um, I had not seen that before. But what you did show me is now why she went dark on us and never responded. And this is the first time hearing about any of this. I didn't know. I didn't know that she went on the air advocating this, even for her own fellow employees, let alone countrymen. <sighs> when it comes to health care, take nothing for granted. Right now. Even if it means you have to turn us off. We're recording it. It'll be up on a podcast later. If you have not done this yet, do not hesitate. Get a hold of our friends at Jace Medical. Now, now, make sure you have the Jace case of venerable antibiotics from AZ to um, doxycycline, amoxicillin. Just can't trust any of this right now. Don't, you can't take anything for granted right now. Make sure you have that in your medicine cabinet, in your cupboard, so that you are not completely vulnerable to this system and these people. All right, go to jacemedical.com, J-A-S-E, jacemedical.com. Enter the code DACE at checkout for a discount on your order. Again, enter the code DACE at checkout when you go to jacemedical.com, J as in Jeff, J-A-S-E, jacemedical.com. Coming up in the overtime today, we're going to be discussing President Biden's decision to run for re-election and what I think it means. And we'll get into that later today for Blaze TV subscribers at blazetv.com slash dace. Again, that's blazetv.com slash dace. That's where you can go to become a Blaze TV subscriber. If you're not yet one, just $10 a month, blazetv.com slash dace. And if you are one, you'll get to watch today's overtime later today right there at blazetv.com slash dace. So while I was away for the past week, taking the divinely mandated sabbatical from the culture war, yeah, all the news stories that Aaron had here, except for the Sherry Markson one at the end, I, I saw all of these. And I, there was only one story that it was difficult to resist temptation to comment on, to break my vow of Sabbath. Because I, I know the rest of these are been there, done that, 
bought the t-shirt, the just daily occurrences and the, the kinds of things, because we do a daily show, you know, and I'm not infected with a deadly bacteria or having allergic, deadly allergic reactions to the meds it takes to defeat said deadly bacteria. The, we would on a daily basis comment on these stories because they're the news of the day. But in reality, it's, it's, it's infotainment, meaning these stories aren't going anywhere. They're not going away. They're not necessarily, well, they should be fundamental and existential, but given how much we have plummeted as a society, they seem almost trite. Mm. There is one story here, though, that was difficult for me that I, I had to pull my fingers away from the keyboard. And it is the Tucker Carlson story. Oh, I thought it was Nikki Haley. No. no. <laughs> um, can you say Hydra? I mean, there's... Could the, you, you just cut that head off and another will form. It's the Republican Party. But it, that will actually play into what I'm about to say here. What happened with Tucker Carlson is the, is the most perfect encapsulation of why the right lost the last era and may have lost permanently. Because I don't see much of a desire right now to walk away from this, to change this paradigm. The chain of events is the thing in which you'll catch the conscience of the king. All right, so you're Rupert Murdoch. You have put up with I mean, go back to when Tucker was here last summer and I asked him point blank when we were having dinner together. You're not doing the show Fox News thought you were going to do, are you? He said, no. Asked him why. And he said, it's because. He goes, you know, I'm like a lot of, I'm, like a lot of conservatives. I'm generically religious. And my wife is very serious about her faith and she's been trying to get me and get my attention on this end for the last few years. But, you know, I grew up in Georgetown. My dad was a GOP operative. Everybody I knew was a Democrat or GOP operative. We took her trick or treated together, little league together. These were all my friends. And, I, and, and, you, and you have all these conversations and you can say, OK, I can see why someone who truly cares about the elderly thinks Medicare is a good idea. Wouldn't be the way I would do it. I don't think it's the best way to do it. But I don't think you're like an enemy of the state per se. OK, he goes. But what happened the last few years is, you know, my wife, my wife proved to be correct. We started doing things. There's no benefit to these things like no traditional constituency of America is benefited by cutting off the genitals of our children. No one benefits from this. And so when we start doing things like that, that there isn't a traditional right left benefit to. He said, I'm just left with the only conclusion that we're just dealing with spiritual forces beyond comprehension then. We're dealing with real darkness. So Rupert Murdoch put up with this since what, 2018? 2016. 2016. Made gonzo money doing this. What was finally the sell point here? Well, three events occurred concurrently. In order, the Dominion lawsuit. And I'm just telling you right now, that story's dead on the right. Whatever you think Dominion is, doesn't matter. After what, after the white flag and the check, Fox gave them the full, as a settlement, gave them the full amount of money they were suing them for, nearly a billion dollars. So, no one with any repute that's not on a fringe platform is going to come close to touching that story ever again after the example that was set there by Fox. So we may just live in a situation for time in memoriam where we just outsource our elections to offshore corporations that have little to no accountability to the people actually doing the voting. Banana Republic much? A banana republic. If you can keep it. Hail Hydra. Indeed. So he cuts that check, right? I don't care who you are, how much money you have, how much Disney paid you for, for the, for the, for Fox movie studio. You cut, you're writing out a check for a billion dollars. You're hurt. And suddenly my tolerance level for what I am willing 
to do to make a buck, that, that margin has shrunk, right? Sure. Next, when RFK Jr. announces his candidacy for the presidency, Tucker Carlson says on the air that the media doesn't delineate because he's actually including his own channel. They did it too. They put a mandate on, jab mandate on New York City employees and, uh, to take the jab there. That the media openly promoted a poisonous shot that is ineffective. Just said that on the air. All true. And by doing that now has at least indirectly indicted, implicated his own employer. Because they did it too. They were one of the ringleaders, in fact. Third, gave a speech at the Heritage Foundation where he said publicly what he said to us here in Iowa privately last summer. We are dealing with forces of true spiritual darkness here. Next thing you know, that speech I believe was on a weekend, right? Next thing you know, on Monday, plug pulled. The chain of events is the thing in which you'll catch the conscience of the king. Here is the biblical lesson here. We cannot rise above our own worldview. Transactionalism is not a permanent arrangement for relationship. In the end, can two walk arm in arm unless they see eye to eye? You cannot be unevenly yoked. We have violated that on the right. And I get it. I get it. Transactionalism is better than no actionalism. But understand, that isn't a permanent state of being for a relationship. It doesn't operate that way. Eventually, the side that is just going along with it, because it's in their best interests, other than their personal convictions, eventually, the cost of continuing that transaction outweighs what their convictions are willing to tolerate. Tucker Carlson broke Rupert Murdoch. And he just couldn't do it anymore. No matter what the cost would be, you don't rise above your own worldview. In the end, he's a godless materialist. Another story came out last week that got very little acclaim, but it's very similar. Peter Thiel. who had become one of the real mega donors on the right in the last few years, announced he's out. He's not getting involved in this election cycle in 24 at all. Thinks Trump is a loser. Then he was going to turn to DeSantis, then found out DeSantis is actually serious about this groomer stuff. So in the end, for all of his claims that he wants to save America and everything else, Peter Thiel's just a homosexual corporatist. That's his worldview. Take away the grooming stuff. How do we pass this on to kids? Because we're not having our own kids. Can't rise above your own worldview. You can't. It Worldview is destiny. If you remember nothing else I'm going to say here on this first show back, or for any show for the remainder of this year, remember this. Worldview is destiny. Every time. And always. And forever. Worldview is destiny. Transactionalism is not a permanent state of being. Why is Trump now arguing that you're too pro-life? Because he's not really pro-life. He adopted a position that would serve his self-interest. And now he's afraid your position threatens them. Worldview is destiny every time. We do not rise above our own worldviews. And frankly, the amount of hegemony it takes in a culture to get godless people to live up to godly standards, maybe we had that kind of hegemony in American culture 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago. We sure as heck don't have it right now. You want me to book Bruce Jenner on the program to double check you on that? Exactly. Is Bruce back on Sean Hannity tonight to say the Democrats are the true transphobes? You cannot rise above your own worldview. In the end, Tucker Carlson pushed Rupert Murdoch's worldview to a place it did not agree with. So no matter how much money it was going to cost him, no matter how much blowback it was going to cost him, he pulled the plug. Peter Thiel did the same thing. Worldview is destiny. Never forget it.
All right, back here on the Steve Day Show. Start taking care of your liver now because the latest data shows that adults with fatty liver were three and a half times more likely to have heart failure than those without. Um, maybe 100 million Americans right now have fatty liver. And it makes sense. I mean, everything from cholesterol, alcohol, toxins, Tylenol, statins, uh, cigarettes, still one, about 20% of the population smokes. We throw everything at our livers these days. And, and they uh, govern about 500 key functions in your body. So your liver is kind of important. So it's time to help your liver. There is a solution. It's the Liver Health Formula. It's an all-natural supplement. Contains 12 clinically proven botanicals that help to recharge and protect your liver. That's manufactured right here in the U.S., approved and done by American doctors. And you can try the Liver Health Formula and receive a free bottle of their omega-3s as well to keep your heart healthy when you go to getliverhelp.com slash Steve. That's getliverhelp.com slash Steve. Go there, get the Liver Health Formula. Uh, claim your free gift when you go to getliverhelp.com slash Steve. All right, let's welcome in our good friend, Bob Vanderplatz. Good to see you again, brother. How are you? Doing very well. Blessed, highly favored. Good to be on your show. It's, uh, I feel the same. I'm feeling great. So you and I were having a conversation over the weekend, and I finally just, you know, we were like, you know, we should have this on the show. Not every conversation we have on the weekend no. should be on the show. No, no. But, but this one probably but, okay. But this one, it, it, it's because you were sharing with me conversations that you've recently had with people associated with both Donald Trump and Ron DeSantis. And you know what? I'm just going to stop right there and hand you the floor. Well, I think the big thing they're wrestling with is how we handle this life issue today. And what it is is that now we're in the post Roe v. Wade world. You know, we finally overturned Roe v. Wade. But now how are you going to handle this in the 2024 campaign? And they bring up quickly what happened in Nebraska, what happened in Kentucky, uh, what happened uh, in Kansas. And they start bringing, you know, you know, life is a losing issue right now. So, so what do we do? And, you know, my direct response to them is I'd much rather be advocating and campaigning on a culture of life than on a culture of death. And Roe v. Wade just didn't push it over to the states. That's, that's everybody's out. Matter of fact, if you look at President Trump's uh, latest comments on it, is that, you know, this got passed on to the states. Give me credit. I appointed the three justices. They overturned Roe v. Wade. It's now in the state's hands. Let's see what the states do with it. Well, that's really an inaccurate way to look at what happened with that opinion. Because well, really what happened to that opinion is that, you know, we're getting it out of our courts and we're putting it over to the people's elective representatives. And a lot of people say, well, that's got to be the states. Well, you know what? Our federal representatives represent us as well and so there needs to be this is going to be an issue in the presidential debate and so we've been talking to the candidates about you know how are you going to address this issue and they they're trying to navigate a line and steve like you and i talked about i mean you don't overturn roe v wade and say hey we really didn't mean it i mean we've been trying to do this for 50 years we're standing up for the sanctity of human life we're saying life begins at conception ends at natural death but you know what, now because politically we're seeing that there might be a, a change, we went too far, now I don't mean it. How are you going to now embrace it with clarity and with conviction that will win over the people of America to say to support your presidency? And Steve, what prompted my call to you when we started talking about this is, uh, and I'm sure he's not going to mind if I bring up his name, but uh, anytime I get an unknown call or a restricted call, I don't take it because you never know. Who's it going to be? And so I'm thinking, you know, they leave a voicemail. If I want to call them back, uh, I'll call them back. So I got an unknown call. I let it go to voicemail. And Steve and my, our, our mutual friend said, Bob, this is Lindsay. Give me a call back. Okay. As in Lindsey Graham. As, as in Lindsey Graham. And you know what? I give, I give Senator Graham a lot of credit here. Lindsey Graham's your hollaback girl? <laughs> no. Well, <laughs> let's just stay the on. The day show's uh, back, baby. Let's stay. <laughs> Let Dace be Dace. <laughs> That's our new slogan. But um, what I'll give Lindsey Graham a lot of credit for is he's saying, no, the federal government definitely has a role here. Because you got Governor Newsom and a lot of these other blue state governors who are basically saying, we'll do... Uh, abortions up till the time of birth. You have Amazon and Google and Dick Sporting Goods and others saying, you know what? 
will pay for that abortion up till the time of birth. We'll even give you your travel expenses and all that stuff, but we'll pay for this. So Lindsey Graham is saying, and he's introduced, I think, what is a minimal standard, a 15-week pain-capable bill of saying that and it's got 70% support. So why, if you're running for president of the United States, would you walk away even from that issue? I, I, I don't know. I, I don't get it. So we're trying to help candidates understand. Um, Who did you how, speak to on the DeSantis side? Because DeSantis, he doesn't have a, technically he is not a candidate. Yeah, yet. he's not a candidate. So it was somebody very uh, familiar with his PAC and, okay. and doing focus groups with the PAC and okay. saying, you know, this life issue is something that, you know, we're going to have to navigate. And Steve, correct me if I'm wrong, but I told him, to me, it's, it's simple, especially in Iowa. The reason when there's a three-year-old lost in the cornfields in the state of Iowa, we will move heaven and earth to find that three-year-old in the cornfields. Why? Because we value a culture of life. Land on a culture of life. For DeSantis, he just signed the heartbeat bill. You know, so you got to own that. I signed the heartbeat bill. Why? Because the, for, the Florida legislature gave me a six-week bill that advanced the protection of human life and preserved the protection of human life. And so, therefore, I signed it. Why? Because as your president, I'm going to land on the side of the culture of life. And you want me to do that as your president. You don't want me to be like Iran and North Korea and others who celebrate a culture of death. This is, America, this is the United States of America. We celebrate a culture of life. So, therefore... We are navigating with these campaigns. And it's not just uh, the DeSantis with his PAC, or it's not just, you know, the former president, uh, President Trump, who Lindsey Graham's trying to advise on this issue as well. It's all the candidates. And I think, you know what, stand up. This is a time to stand up and advocate and clearly communicate. Why are you and why are we the party for the sanctity of human life? All right. Let's pause for a second, because... I want everything that you just said to soak in and I'll tell the audience really quick about our friends over at my Patriot supply. Did you guys see the story this morning? Now the government Venezuela style, we're just brokering which banks get to purchase the other ones. The government just, it's kind of an extension of what we saw in 2020, you know, what's essential, what's non-essential. Um, make sure you're connected with my Patriot supply, the nation's largest preparedness company right now. They're offering you a special deal. If you're looking around and saying, yeah, I don't know that I trust the people that are managing things. You've got an IQ above 12. Congrats. All right. So make it go higher by contacting our friends at my Patriot supply, get their three month emergency food kit, which lasts for up to 25 years with proper storage with each kit you order. With each kit you order, you'll receive a bonus package of crucial survivor survival gear worth up to $200, all of that for free. The three-month emergency food kit from My Patriot Supply, breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks, even drinks, the full complement of the 2,000-plus calories that you need every day. Uh, to get this emergency food and your free survival gear worth over $200, go to MyPatriotSupply.com. That is mypatriotsupply.com. Okay. So I can sense there are people in the audience saying, well, I thought we the point of Roe v. Wade was for states to decide and all this. I, I want to table that entire conversation because it's, it's utterly meaningless. Here's why. If you're Donald Trump, you cannot nuance out of the, the, the voter that says, you know, I was totally against voting for Trump who has 10,000% name ID. I was totally against it. I mean, I watched him be president for four years. I've watched him as a candidate for the last eight years. And I'm, I'm, I'm just, I was on the fence. But then he gave me this incredibly nuanced view of abortion. And I thought to myself, yeah, Maybe I was wrong. It doesn't exist. That, there, that voter, that human being, does not exist. There are 330 plus million Americans. Not one of those people I just described exists and is eligible to vote. Doesn't happen. Similarly, there is not a single voter that was like, yeah, I was really on the fence with Ron DeSantis and he signed that heartbeat legislation last week and I'm not really sure, you know, but... Um, but now he's got this incredible, no, 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 doesn't exist. There are no voters here. Let me repeat this. 
There's no voters here. You cannot outrun your position. If you're Donald Trump, you're the guy who overturned Roe v. Wade. You have to own that, be proud of it, and say, yeah, states, the Roe v. Wade now does allow states to decide, but I sure as hell they don't they sure as hell hope they don't decide to do the stuff California's talking about. We don't want nobody exactly. wants that. If you're Ron DeSantis, your position is I signed in terms of time period, the strictest abortion ban in America. Now it's loaded with all the, it is loaded with all the exceptions that every consultant demands. Okay, the, the, the beautiful exceptions. It has them all. So the consultants should all be happy. Rejoicing in the bowels of Fox News. All, all exception boxes checked. But the reality is all those exceptions only mean about seven or eight percent of all the abortions done in America, which means he effectively in the state of Florida banned over 90 percent of abortions after what is it? Six weeks, six weeks, six weeks. Okay, he banned over 90 percent of abortions in a state of 21 million people after six weeks. It's even with all those ridiculous exceptions, which you guys all know I hate. It's still actually the strictest abortion ban in the country. And you just look at the numbers. That's your position, Ron. You're not outrunning that. And the thing now, I know now to be fair, we don't know that he wants to. You just talked to some you just talked to a guy running focus groups at a super PAC. Like he's going to be a candidate here at, later this month and he'll get to answer all these questions for us. OK, but I'll say to him preemptively what I'm saying to Trump currently, you cannot take these policies and run away from them. You are the guy, Don, that overturned Roe. You cannot out, new, there is no voter that will up, reconsider you for all, after everything else they know because you found, in fact, you'll turn off your own people. You'll have, you'll have all these pro-life groups go to war against you, which is starting to happen now. Same thing to Ron. I hope you're watching this. Your position is, is what you just signed in Florida two weeks ago. That's your position. You can't run away from it. Don't listen to your super PAC or anybody else. That's your position, bro. You signed the bill. That's your position. Own it. There is no other position. That's your position. And Steve, you're exactly right. Matter of fact, uh, Marjorie Danensfelser, who leads SBA Pro-Life, uh, she tweeted about Donald Trump. Remember, she took Trump to task on his nuanced position and saying, this is not going to work. This is not going to fly. So what you're talking about, you're going to turn off the very base that's going to get you elected, the very base that should be excited to get you reelected, whether you're Trump or whether you're DeSantis or whether you're any one of the others. But you need to champion the culture of life and turn Governor Newsom, Joe Biden, and all these others into the extreme position, which it is. It's exceptionally out of step with America. And by the way, and we argue this at the family all the time, abortion is not a state's issue. It's not a federal issue. It's a moral issue. It's right and wrong issue. So champion a culture of life. Be consistent. Be clear with your conviction and move on to the next issue. But if you allow this to be nuanced, Matter of fact, I just watched um, an interview with the with the former president, Donald Trump, about this. Would you support Lindsey Graham's 50, 15 week ban, which I think is a bare minimum pain capable? He said, well, I'm sure we're going to work this out. Everybody's going to be happy. I, this is this will get all done. But he didn't say anything. What he's trying to do. And everybody knows he's not. He's not addressing the answer. If you're voting he's on abortion, to, to do that. If you are voting on abortion, if 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 if, if you are voting, it's. It's, it's not necessarily what polls say about issues. Gun control is always popular, but it's what the people who actually vote on that issue think. So gun control is generically popular, but the people who vote on guns are Second Amendment people. Similarly, it, it's, it's not so much what the polls say, but what the people are, how they uh, the, uh, vote on that issue, how they vote. If you're voting on, can I kill my kid? There is nothing absolutely freaking nothing the guy who overturned Roe v. Wade can do to win your vote. Nothing. Nothing. If you're going to the polls thinking, I want to kill my kid if I want, he's just the guy that overturned Roe, took your idol, smashed it in your face, and, and, and dunked on you. You don't outrun that. And if you're Ron DeSantis, you're the guy that said, I'm banning 90% of abortions in, in the third largest state in the country after six weeks. You're just that guy. There's no other position. If, if, if anybody voting on this, that's cut and dried. It's only a loser for you to try anything else. You weren't winning any of those voters anyway. So the deal, I mean, if I'm if I'm reading this right, 
if you are consistent and clear on a pro-life message, you will drive, you will increase your voter turnout with a pro-life base. And that's the base you need to turn to out. To match the drive of the other people that are going to turn out against you no matter what. Because the person who says, you know, I want abortion up to demand. They're, uh, they are not voting for any. They're not voting for Nikki Haley. They're not voting for Vivek Ramaswamy, for any other woman. Why? Because they're already laying on the culture of life. So you have to own it and move it forward. And by the way, we in 21st century America, with all the science that's out there, we should welcome this debate. So if the polls aren't right or for whatever isn't right, change the minds of the electorate. Let them know why a culture of life matters in the greatest country in the world. We got about 90 seconds. You two have a reaction to the conversation Bob and I just had? Well, uh, it's not shocking in uh, the least that we're this uh, bad at this, uh, which is why I don't want to get back to normal on any front, because normal is what got us here. And if these guys are going to be so bad at it again, how about we let the enemy speak just like in uh the nefarious movie just roll tape on these people what they say and what believe if you if you're not at the point in your life donald trump or ron DeSantis or whoever uh, uh, to uh, articulate exactly what's going on at a high saint augustine level show what these baby killing bastards actually say what they believe and no and not just on tiktok on the floor of the house chamber in in uh, nebraska it's godless pagan throw your baby in the volcano stuff if you don't have the courage to roll tape on that kind of stuff and show where the culture really is Please don't run for president, any one of you. So Donald Trump in just the last few days as well has said what he's, I think, said on, on a few occasions in the past, saying he'll pursue a nationwide 50-state ban on child sexual mutilation. That's good. How can you, how is it controvertible? It's, it's how just is not, it it's not. How is it to say that it's not. child genital mutilation is wrong and should be banned, but hey, let's have a, uh, a but nuanced child murders approach, okay on approach a state to, by state to basis. child sacrifice. Yeah. Now is the time to go out and win we might not win the argument with this it might just be past that time but you know what i know it's t- it, i know I, I know we're done for on the life issue if we don't at least attempt to win now is the time to do it when you have this opportunity there is no ifs ands or buts about it that's Very really well that's really well said yeah, 20, 10 seconds last real word. quick trump is the one who's been nuanced on this Governor DeSantis's credit, he signed the heartbeat bill in the state of Florida. He's well, been, he might, he's he might want to get hold of his super PAC yeah. before he becomes a candidate yeah. and make sure that they're getting the well, message. Yeah. Well, I think what the super PAC's worried about is that, you know, we got these elections and the focus groups. The thing it is, Ron DeS- it's going to be up to Ron DeSantis to make the final decision. Come back. Hour two is next. All right, back here with Hour 2, uh, live and on demand here on Blaze TV, radio and podcast. Yet again, want to give a quick shout out, Mid-Vermont Christian School, wearing their swag today. Remember, they are the school who risked decertification athletically in the state of Vermont to stand for sanity, setting an example for all of us. So figured it, it would be a fitting message first day back after literally whatever the hell the last couple of weeks was um, to, to rep somebody uh, that uh, kind of sends a message of what will be needed and required for the era and the enemy and enemies which we face. So uh, shout out to them yet again on the show. And uh, I know a lot of you, because I put out the link, a lot of you uh, went out and bought their swag and helped them raise a lot more money than they were counting on. So thank you very much for that. Don't forget, you can let us know what you think about what we think via the stevedace.com inbox by emailing us, steve at stevedace.com. That's D-E-A-C-E, in case you'd forgotten the last couple of weeks. Like us on Facebook, MeWe, and Gab. You can follow me at Steve Day Show on uh, Twitter, Getter, Instagram, and TikTok. And then you can uh, also... Uh, find us over on Truth Social at Real Steve Dace there. Those of you that listen to the podcast version, thank you so very much. And if you have yet to do this, please leave us a five-star review. Hit subscribe or follow. And thank you to each and every one of you that have done those things for us already. Uh, this part of the show brought to you by our friends at Relief Factor. If you are dealing with constant or consistent pain, there's two types of reasons physically you would be dealing with that. One of them 
So we thought my wife had torn her meniscus. Turned out after the MRI, it's actually just bone spurs from too much arthritis in the knee. She lost a whole bunch of weight, starts doing Pilates, and her knees just weren't ready for that activity yet. Okay, so she's got to go in there and do the classic cleanup operation instead, so it's not nearly as invasive. So that's an example of clinical pain. All right, she's got these bone spurs floating around in her knee. She needs professional medical help to deal with that. If, however, you have what's called chronic pain, that's because you have too much inflammation in your body, probably in your joints. And that's where our friends at Relief Factor come in. It is drug free, but it's developed by physicians who do prescribe drugs. They came up with this unique formula for fighting back against inflammation in the body. They believe so much in it. They offer you a three week starter kit for just 20 bucks to get started. Just 20 bucks. Why? Because over the years, what they have found is about 70% of those who try the starter kit end up becoming regular or permanent customers because of the results they see in three weeks or less. All right. So what do you have to lose? You've tried everything else with your chronic pain. Try this for just 20 bucks at relieffactor.com. That's relieffactor.com or call them at 800 for the number four relief 800 for relief. So it is that time again. We haven't done one of these in a few weeks. It's been a spell. Yeah, with a lot of other stuff going on. But uh, let's get back to some form of regular order here on the show. It is your opportunity to ask me anything. Questions curated by Todd over on, and by those of you that submitted them over on Facebook. Todd, you have selected the questions. I've not seen any of these questions, so I will get hit with all of them cold. Aaron, you have the questions. Let's get it started. And we will begin with Natalie Brin, who says, I'm literally exhausted from three years of outrage. Every day there's a story after story after story. It's exhausting and demoralizing. My life is firmly planted in Jesus, so I truly have hope. I don't want to return to my life of ignorance, but it's a lot to keep up with. How do you think we can keep a good balance of being informed and active versus being downright unpleasant because everything sucks? <laughs> well, you know, this this goes to what I discussed briefly at the top of the show today. So, um, <clears throat> one, it's okay to Sabbath. It, it's okay to take breaks. It's okay to say, you know, it, it was so reassuring. I, I just laughed. I, I noticed our podcast ranking went up last week and, and I, I didn't do a single live show. <laughs> okay. I didn't do a single live show. Um, nefarious plot has, is, is in the, is in the top 200 overall on Amazon. We may sell more of nefarious plot this month. It's possible then we sold its initial release in 2016. Now, when, when Glenn had me on six months after it came out, we sold a poop ton of the books then. But it is quite possible that we ended up selling more of a nefarious plot in April of 2023 than we did in March of 2016 when the book came out. And I wasn't on the air, you know, for a a lot of April doing a lot of promotion of that book. My point is that I'm really not that needed. And I don't say that to be self-deprecating or give you a false humility. It's actually very reassuring to learn that it's not on you. It's just not. We don't have to be engaged all the time. We, we don't have to be at max lit all the time. Even in the midst of one of their greatest captivities, the Lord said to his people Israel through the prophet Ezekiel, farm, get married, make babies. I mean, still enjoy the the simple things of life that I grant you. And we can turn our commitment to the cause, we can turn that into an idol too. It's okay to Sabbath. It's okay to take breaks. It's okay to disconnect. It's okay to put things in their proper order. And... Going back to what I said at the top of the show, 
I have spent a good deal of time in the last week trying to discern what does apostles, not assassins, mean. And the the big takeaway I have from that after mulling that over for nearly a week is to be even more intentional about imposing a biblical worldview on the events of the day. One, you're going to learn God's not surprised. We've done all this as a species before. Now, maybe we've not done it in English before. Maybe we've not done it on this landmass before, but we have done this all before. I mean, there was once a period of time where the world became so dark that God uh, literally hit control, alt, delete with a flood. And yet, we're here 2,000 years later. So you'll gain some confidence from that. And you'll get a reminder that things work on God's timetable, not our own. And a lot of the angst and worry goes away. I can't promise you the anger will. I mean, I I don't know how you can't be angry at what we are doing to ourselves right now, to our children right now. The anger in and of itself is not wrong. Paul just says, hey, in, in in your anger, don't sin. So it's okay to take a break. And I can't speak for a lot of other audiences on the right around the country because I only know this one intimately. And my guess is much of this audience would probably struggle to make a commitment to the cause more of an idol than a complacency towards that end. Like if you believe the secret sauce here is just to go home and watch Fox news and vote team GOP dutifully in every election to keep saving America. I'm thinking either you stumbled upon this show by accident and are seriously reevaluating that choice of whether to stick around or we probably got rid of you purged you a while ago. Fair. Yeah. Yeah. I, so my guess is that, that a lot of the people listening here are people that have some level of commitment to do something about this. You know, and so we can't let our commitment to do something about this become an idol either. It's okay to Sabbath. It's okay to take breaks. It's okay to be reminded that we're not as needed and necessary as we think we are. That did I say we're not needed or necessary at all? No, no, I didn't say that. That would be wrong too. That would be wrong too. But to act as if if I'm not plugged in, if I miss this, if I'm not on for me, if I'm not on the air this particular day. You know, as as I said last hour, a full week went by and I kept that commitment. I didn't publicly engage on anything involving the culture war for a solid week. And I mean, there was all kinds of stories and news I saw, and there was really only one I really had to resist the temptation to chime in on. One. And like the whole week, when I like didn't have an expectation because it was part of, I guess, my calling or job to just chime in on what the events of the day are, regardless of what they were. But since it was really about what really matters, since that, since I didn't have that obligation for the last week, it was really about, is it really worth my time? And the only story that really I had to pull my fingers away from the keyboard a couple times was the Tucker Carlson story. So... That's another thing Sabbath thing does is it gives you some perspective and priority. So it's okay to take a break. It's okay to rest. Next question. We go to Stephen Johnson. If you could ask Nefarious which American president has been most instrumental in bringing the USA to the edge of the abyss, what might his answer be? I th- that, that is a fascinating question. And, and you have to remember that the book was written at the height of the Obama era. 
And so therefore, I believe Nefarious would say it's Obama. That he represented a generational breakthrough that came at the dawn and the advent of the social media era. The ability to make everything in politics now granular because it's that you know what i don't know if you intended this this actually ties into the other the previous question very well there were 24-hour news cycles before obama there were not 24-hour debate cycles there were not 24-hour outrage cycles there were not 24-hour crisis cycles before obama And it's because he brought that leftist mentality, not ideology, but even more than that, mentality. I mean, Bill Clinton, remember, dodged the draft, went to the Soviet Union. Probably read a few Noam Chomsky books, I would imagine. I mean, Hillary was one of the OG feminists at Wellesley College. But... They may have been leftist in their ideology, but they still came from an era that had to recognize political reality, right? Like the first half of his first term, he could try to go hard left. Then when he suffers the worst midterm election defeat, any incumbent president not involved in a civil war has ever suffered. He stands up the very next January at the, at the at State of the Nation address and says, the era of big government is over. Okay, because he has to acknowledge some forms of political reality, or at least he thinks that he does. Obama was the first president that refused all of that, never triangulated, never moderated. He also suffered a monumental defeat in his first midterm, didn't triangulate or moderate at all, suffered an even bigger midterm defeat in his second midterm, didn't triangulate, moderate at all. Why? Because the advent of social media allowed him to consistently shape the environment in ways no other president, frankly, could in in, in history. Because it's kind of the ability every time to jump on here and get me lit up. Oh, it's those racist Republicans again. Oh, it's those homophobic Republicans again. It's not just a talking point in the New York Times, Washington Post, that frankly, only a scant percentage of people are reading. No matter how much it filters down through the tributaries into their local media, you could still walk by the newspaper machine and never buy one, right? Mm -hmm. You can just flip off the channel, right? The alerts on the phone hits you at at a molecular level. I remember in the 08 caucuses, they were the first campaign to ever do micro targeting. People in Iowa had never seen this. This was at the very advent. People were still using MySpace at this point, guys. And so you start getting messages from Michelle Obama. You think they're from her. We'd never seen anything like this. Now, now we know what these are and everybody right and left does these and they just annoy the hell out of us. We delete them. But in the, in the, in the summer of 2007, leading up to the 08 caucuses, this had never been done before. And so that technology combined with his ideology allowed him to install a permanent leftist methodology where they felt as if they could operate outside of political reality. The natural ebbs and flows of a duopoly. If you go too far one way, there's a reverb for it. We'd seen this this pattern for decades. It ended in Obama. And so I think Nefarious would say it's him. Because he represented a permanent change in one of the major political parties. And the other, the other major political party has really still not recovered from this. Trump adopted a lot of Obama's social media tactics, even using things like Eventbrite to book these massive rallies and build their list. And it helped him shock the system to win both the nomination and the election. No shock. Then shortly after he takes office, all of a sudden here comes all kinds of unprecedented censorship in social media because they didn't want to emulate that again. They didn't want to let us emulate that practice. 
And what you are seeing now is, as a candidate, Trump will emulate Obama's levels of gaslighting against his own side. And then when he comes up against the other side, it's let's cut a deal. Uh, we can't shut the government down. Uh, well, actually, now we need to shut the government down um, because of COVID. And, and see, that's the, that's the difference. You can't rise above your own worldview. That's, there's three kinds of people in politics, crusaders, gangsters, and groupies. That's the difference when a gangster like Trump attempts to transactionally use these things. But as I said about Rupert Murdoch last hour, eventually the gangster comes to the price point that doing what is right is just too high of a price to pay and he doesn't want to pay it anymore. And even if even if the blowback is extraordinary, he'll take that rather than continuing to pay the price for something in the end he just truly doesn't believe. But was willing to inhabit it for a while to his own benefit. With Obama, you had a classic crusader. And so remember those videos where, you know, they'd have the budget fights and John Boehner would go up to the White House as the speaker. Nothing would change. He'd come out in the driveway where we're at an impasse and we can't shut the government. He was just negotiating against himself. Because Obama was out there to win an argument against history. John Boehner was out there to win a news cycle. That's an L every time. That's an L every time. And I think with the, what the, what the right has not responded with, and I'm not sure that it can, frankly. Too many of the people that write too many of the checks around here, as we talked about last hour with Tucker, don't agree with us. And they're never going to agree with us. Think about Peter Thiel. For a while, he was writing all kinds of checks to all these right-wing causes. Now he's completely out. He thinks Trump's a political loser. He was going to then glom on to DeSantis. And then now he sees DeSantis as serious about the anti-groomer stuff. And in the end, he's just a gay rich guy. That's You never rise above your own worldview. In the end, he knows. I can't reclamate my core ideology as a homosexual without access to kids. And so if DeSantis is going to punish that at a one-on-one -on -one level, no matter how much I've funded causes for the Constitution and everything else in the future, in the end, I can't rise above my own worldview. I'm just a gay corporatist. That's just really what I am. And I think the, the right, I'm not sure the right can, could, is even willing to handle an Obama kind of a character. Someone who goes for broke and doesn't care about losing. <clears throat> There's so much money to be made on the right, so many clicks to be had, so many bills to be paid, so much grift to get it collected. I, I, you know, and I think that's, I frankly think that's why you see some of the people you respect turning on DeSantis or leaving him behind, I think it is a fear that he might be an Obama-esque character, that he might be willing to say, I don't care what it costs me. It's what I really believe, so we're going in. Well, I kind of care what it costs me. It might, you know, cost me my syndication deal. It might cost me access to a monetize, to a, being monetized on social media. So I, I kind of care. You know what I'm saying? I, I just, I don't think there are really truly that many go-for-broke figures on the right. And it shows whenever these two clash at an existential level. <clears throat> Next up, we go to Susan Wagner Baldwin, who says uh, or asks, what is going to be the most significant personal change you'll make because of your supernatural encounter with God? Some of the things I think we just talked about. Be more intentional about Sabbathing, remind, reminding myself I'm really not that important. I'm really not. Doesn't mean I don't have any importance. I, I mean, the amount of notes I got from you guys over the last few weeks about how God has allowed us to use, to, to be a show that inspired you, encouraged you in some, you know, incredible way is incredible. But it's, it's because of the gifts God has given us and the, and the platform he has given us. If we weren't here, he wouldn't, God wouldn't have left you hanging out to dry. 
The honor is ours, not the other way around. And to be even more intentional about deploying a biblical worldview, even more intentional. It's always been our, our prime directive, but maybe it's time now for me to just, particularly after this last election cycle, just to completely divorce myself from any form of conventional political analysis. You know, I mean, look at the conversation we have the Bob we had with Bob Vanderplatz last hour. The top two candidates for the GOP presidential nominee nomination, um, one of them ended Roe versus Wade, and now thinks he can adapt and adopt some nuanced position on abortion. Uh, no, you can't. Another guy has uh, the DeSantis, who just signed. Uh, a heart, a six-week heartbeat bill. Was it last week? Two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, yeah. Has the guy has someone about over on a super PAC now trying to figure out how to, well, how we get a game plan around that? Uh, you're not, bro. That's your that's your position. I mean, it just, you know, I mean, at this point in time, I just think maybe there's no place at all um, for any form of traditional political analysis, and it might just be time to full time Francis Schaefer this thing. Speaking of, Michael Miller has this. In the Apostles' Creed, we profess our belief in Christ. There is one sentence that states that our Savior descends into hell. I do not see a reference to that in the Gospels. Could this be a translation error? Actually, What's your I, do position? Think, I do think it references this in the Bible. Let me, let me Google this right now since I, don't, I didn't know this was coming. So, but I do believe that this is referenced. Um. Yeah, it's, in, it's, it's not mentioned in the Gospels, it's mentioned in Ephesians, which is written by Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament. So, it's it, depending on how you translate it, um, it's Ephesians 4.9. Um, it's into the lower parts of the earth that's often translated as descended into hell. Um, now, I believe you guys refer to this as the raising of hell, right? Something like that. Isn't Among that, other things. Okay. So, you know, I mean, if, if you may, you may think that if you're a Protestant, you may take issue with that part if you want, but it is specifically mentioned in the scriptures by the guy who wrote most of the New Testament. It's just not in the Gospels, it's in Ephesians. Next up, we have Kevin Freiberger. What's your position on baptism? Are you a sprinkle with water or an immersion in water baptized? And why do you believe in infant baptism or believer's baptism? From watching the Nefarious movie, I'm interested in your view. So I'm sure you picked up on that in our movie. I mean, our film was written and directed by two, I mean, hardcore, you know, I mean, old English Latin mass Catholics. So, um, we used to just call those Catholics. Well, that's what you used to call. That's what you used to call them. Right. Now they're, uh, you call yourselves trads. Everyone else says weird, um, because of the direction this has gone. But, um, um, in the Bible, there, there is no infant baptism. However, also in the Bible, there is no age of accountability. So what, what Protestantism has done in, and not all, there are, there are plenty of Protestant denominations, by the way, that do believe in infant baptism. It's just of the, the dispensational ones that kind of come out of the Moody Schofield uh, era, which a lot of what's left of American evangelicalism does because of a lot of the other Protestant denominations went lib that, that did believe in infant baptism went liberal in the early 20th century. And so there's just a lot of things that I think a lot of Protestants don't even know about uh, Protestantism itself because only one particular strand of Protestantism has held on to, to re has really held on to, sola script, to much of sola scriptura for the last century or so in America. Uh, but... The idea of it, so what, what Protestants basically did to counter infant baptism, because the Catholic or the other Protestant denominations who believe this, the challenge is, well, what happens to those of us, I mean, we all agree we're all born in original sin, right? Every yeah. tribe agrees with this. Yeah. Every, every tribe of small O orthodoxy agrees we are all born into sin, right? So this is your, this is your tribe's answer to this. 
Okay. And so it's an obvious question. So if we're not going to baptize but children, um, you know, then what's your, so what, you know, three-year-olds that die in car accidents, they go to hell. I mean, what's the answer, right? Does that sound like the character of God that you see play out through the narrative of, the, of biblical history? And so the answer uh, that Protestants, that, that Protestant wings that didn't believe in infant baptism came up with largely is what's called an age of accountability that essentially not, and if you see this in left behind books, um, for example, when the rapture happens, all believers are raptured and children, what is it, Aaron, under 12 or 13? Yes, it's something like something that. Something like that yeah. are also all raptured as well because they're below the age of accountability. There is nothing in the Bible about that. It, it's an inference, maybe a good one, a strong one. Then again, you guys would say infant baptism is a, is a good, is a, is an inference, a good one and a strong one. Right. And so, um, my answer is, I'm going to trust a God who spares not even his only son in order to bridge the chasm between me and him to deal justly with such matters. Next up, we go to Dean Jones, who asks this. After working with the movie Nefarious, do you feel that Christians can be, I think he means demonically possessed? I've always been taught that can't happen. How do we explain why Christians are capable of some of the bad things that non-believers are as well. I don't believe that Christians can be possessed. Um, I I do believe they can be influenced. I, I do believe if you turn away from your faith, um, if you are, you know, backslidden is a popular term in some evangelical places. Um, I, I, I do believe that you can be influenced uh, by what's happening around you culturally um, by external influences, but I don't believe that believers can be demonically possessed. That would actually go against the perseverance of the saints, which I'm a firm believer in that. Jesus said, no one can come to me except those whom God sent to me, uh, who God, except the God who sent me sends them to me, and then I will raise them up on the last day. Nothing separates us ultimately from the love of God. Um, and that's Romans 8. I, I don't believe that, that believers can be demonically possessed. I do believe outside of God's will and outside of um, an active relationship with God that they are consistently engaged in, they can succumb to the wrong kinds of influences. A lot of Americans have had it done supporting companies that rake in hundreds of millions, sometimes billions of dollars, while trashing the country that made their success possible. You want a parallel economy, and you want it now. Unfortunately, we can't make it happen that fast, but one place where it does exist right now just so happens to be with the product that we all need this day and age in modern America, our mobile phones. Make the switch now to Patriot Mobile, really the only American mobile phone company left. They'll give you nationwide coverage on all three major networks. Um, the best possible service. If you move to an area of town or an area of the country where one network underperforms, you want to make the switch, they'll help you make that switch for free whenever you want at Patriot Mobile right now. Plus, you get a free activation with the offer code Steve. A free activation with the offer code Steve when you go to PatriotMobile.com slash Steve. That's PatriotMobile.com slash Steve. Use the offer code Steve for the offer, or you can just call them at 878-PATRIOT. Again, that's 878-PATRIOT. All right, let's get back to some Ask Me Anything. Great questions so far this week. Good stuff. Next up, we go to Rob Corser, who asks, could Nefarious's performance at the box office be a result of a current propensity to wait for streaming by its target age demographic? Possible. I think there's several factors. That's one of them, but I don't think it's one of the major factors. I, I think the the two major reasons why are, um, I mean, there's just there were too many movies. And I said this at the time when we when we chose April 14th as a release date, it was the end of January. I mean, Hollywood doesn't usually give 60 day advance notice. Hey, a movie is coming out. They usually give us six months, a year, two years notice. Like right now, you know, right now, July 11th, 2025 is when the James Gunn Superman legacy movie is coming out. I mean, we got, th we got two months, two months to go to even get to uh, two years out to July 11th, you know? So, um, it's just, 
I guess probably just a coincidence that all these movies that were in this backlogged catalog from COVID all got dropped after we picked our date. The Pope's exorcist had been, had been, uh, had been targeted for Easter weekend for months after, right after we picked our date, they moved to to our date on April the 14th, the week after Easter, I guess you can believe all those things are coincidences. I think that's, that's part of it. And so it, we didn't get a lot of time to build word of mouth. You're seeing now as word of mouth is built, <clears throat> our, you know, 70% of our theaters this week did better this week than they did last week. That's incredible. So <clears throat> part of it is we just got boxed out by too many movies. The other, <clears throat> pardon me, this is the longest I've talked in a while, guys. Uh, the other is our own mistake or fault or gamble, depending on how you look at it. We cost ourselves millions of dollars by marketing the film as, to the horror community, trying to go to Nineveh and reach the unsaved. And the way we needed to market the movie to that community freaked too many of you out. And so like yesterday, I got a call from a, a, a ministry leader. Almost all of you in this audience would know. Called me out of the blue on a Sunday. These guys are a little busy on Sundays. Yeah. Yeah. Called me out of the blue on a Sunday. Well, they should be. <clears throat> this one definitely is. Okay. Uh, called me out of the blue on a Sunday because of how much he was impacted by the movie in the book. Hey, you never heard of him before, just in the last week or so. He's already taken two groups to the theater to see it. A third group from his church was going yesterday, you know? And so I, I think because, and I, I get it. I mean, we made this choice and, and, and I should, I'm going to own that. I mean, I, I was a, a, a huge advocate of trying to make a play into that community. Why? 31 horror films were released last year. 35 will be released this year. And they're not, they're not the horror films we grew up watching, guys. When they get into the supernatural, it's not, let's get some jump scares. Yeah, you have the Conjuring universe out there that does at least address some form of a biblical worldview. But most of the horror movies that deal with the supernatural are Beelzebub casting out Beelzebub. You know, the old model, Todd, when we were growing up, when our parents were growing up, take your girlfriend there, you know, she gets scared, a little cuddling, a little heavy petting. And at the end, some priest or pastor shows up to cast out the entity and everybody goes home happy. The good guys win, right? Okay. They don't make those movies anymore. They're nihilistic. They're dark now. Uh, they're openly promoting the occult now. <clears throat> and so, you know, I was, a, as executive producer, I was a vocal, staunch advocate of trying to reach that audience. And we agreed as a team to go, that, to go for that. And it didn't work to the extent that we wanted. And I think the marketing it took to reach those people, as great as that trailer uh, that we created was, I think a lot of believers saw that trailer and said, oh, no, and it freaked them out. And that, that decision's going to cost us millions of dollars, frankly. Which I mean, does millions. Not, which I'm just saying for myself, which does not mean <clears throat> it was a mistake. We just got done talking about Christ descending into hell. Mm -hmm. You were willing to descend into hell. It yeah. was the right thing to do. That's what we Everybody tried to do. Else can, I didn't have anything to do with the production of this movie, but as long as I'm sitting here, it was not a mistake. It was, this is not a job to tickle everybody's ears. I mean, that poster, you know, I was heavily influential in the design of that poster over your shoulder there, Todd. I, I wouldn't hang that poster at my own church. But it's not, it's not, wasn't for you, you know? And so um, that decision may be, the, the, may turn out, we'll see what happens with streaming and everything else. I don't know. I don't know that world at all, but to learn uh, in real time. Um, in the last time that, you know, Carrie and Chuck released a movie, PVOD didn't exist yet. That was introduced, you know, Unplanned came out in 2019 pre-COVID. That came out during the COVID era. So we don't know how many people will go on iTunes or Amazon and, and buy it for $19.99 when we go there. And, and I think it's looking like June now. We don't know. But that decision to try to missionally market it to the horror community, depending how we do in streaming, may ultimately determine whether we can pay our investors back or not. It may be the reason we don't. And I was a huge reason we made that decision. So I'll own it. Next up, we go to Allie Bertram Rhodes. <clears throat> Meditating on the part of your testimony in which you realized so many in the hospital who are going along with the protocols are really sheep and not wolves. You said you felt called to be an apostle, not an assassin. Well, I've been confronted with a situation in which a polite man is moving in next door to my family. His 
husband will be moving in next month. My instinct is to stay away and avoid as much as possible, as I don't want my five-year-old daughter aware of their living situation. How would an apostle treat this situation? I'm so mad, I have to accept that this is my neighborhood next to my daughter. Steve, you have personal experience yes, with this. I do. Your neighbor literally <laughs> flies the flag. Yeah. Just to put a... You, there are so many questions about this general theme. Mm -hmm. So there's another one coming down the pike if we have enough time about the specific application. But you definitely sparked something theologically uh, in in this. So I just, you've already brought up the notion, but I just want to know how many times people are addressing it to specifics in their own lives. We're going to probably have to address this to specifics for the foreseeable future. Okay. Um, first and foremost, when this happened in my neighborhood, my kids were all either post puberty or about there. So we had already had all these conversations, you know? Um, at five years old, your primary focus at five years old is to protect the innocence of your children. No, n n no question about that in my mind. Part of that, though, is to also model proper Christ-like behavior. Because in a few years, when they're old enough to, when she's old enough to know what is going on, you're going to have to justify how you behaved towards these neighbors. And so, if I were in your situation, I would. I mean, I can answer that question for you. It's the reason we homeschooled. We homeschooled our kids to give them as much innocence while they were kids as possible. And then, when the time came, when they were ready, they would then. They, they, they'd had their childhood. You'd ask Anna now. Ask our oldest now. She is very, very grateful. She got an actual childhood. Very grateful. What do I mean by that? Got to play pretend. Got to think all that matters in the world is mom and dad love each other. You know, the simple things we took for granted for generations. Okay? She got that for a few years. And I think you should... in Your primary... As, as, as a mama bear is to protect the innocence of your child. But, um, so I would not be eager to expose her to what is going on, but I also would not let her see me hiding away or, um, being suspicious or, uh, being demeaning towards that situation either because the time will come where she will understand. And then, you know, these man, Kids are little, they're just rolling tape, man. All right? They are, they are rolling tape from day one. <laughs> All right? You think they're not paying attention? They freaking don't miss anything. All right? If, there's, if, if raising now nearly three kids to adulthood has taught me anything, it is that. They don't miss anything. They are rolling tape. So, um, I would put the emphasis on protecting my daughter's innocence, but I would also have as part of that equation recognition that she's watching and she doesn't understand right now, but she's banking tape of how I am behaving in this situation. And when the time comes that she is of age to understand that, do I want, do I want that tape to honor the testimony that I'm trying to model for her? Does that make sense? Yes. Anybody want to add any of that? No, I think that's sufficient. You're going to have to be uh, nimble uh, in this circumstance you, you, because just you, 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 there's more details within the potential of the generality you brought up. Uh, the gay person who lived next to Steve and I 20 years ago is not necessarily the gay person who lives to you. Yeah, you now. might have, you might not have even known yes. twenty years ago. Or now now there's a trans flag next to yeah, me in my exactly. neighborhood. Exactly. Okay, a trans flag next to me in my neighborhood. So, you know, um, and the person who may respect, uh, hey, we're, we're gonna do our own thing. You do yours. Mm -hmm. Other than that, you know, it looks pretty much the same. Now the odds of that th 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 are far far less. And how you know you may you may this per these people may 
have as their call of duty, just like in every part of life, their neighbors, their people they work with to test you because they are practicing a religion. I don't know. All right. Let's talk about, this is a great place to talk about our friends over at Preborn. And then we will get like a lightning round and to close things out. All right. Uh, the goal this year is to save 70,000 babies. That's what we want to do via our friends over at Preborn. Uh, their networks of clinics bring hope to pregnant women who are considering killing their children. They confront them gently, but it is a confrontation uh, with their ultrasounds, the imaging, the heartbeat. They can see that they are carrying an actual child that that's a live human being they are carrying. And what they have found over, over the years, about 80% of the time, the conscience of that mother will be convicted and she doesn't go forward with killing her child. But they, they also understand, though, that that's not where the battle ends. That's the biggest part of the battle, but it is ongoing because a lot of times these moms are in crisis and they need help. So they provide counseling, uh, postnatal care, car seats, uh, and they do all that stuff for free as well because of donations from people like you and me. So if you want to be the next to help them rescue both the mom and the baby, just dial pound 250 and say the keyword baby on your mobile phone. Pound 250, keyword baby on your mobile phone, or you can show your love that has the power to save a life by going to preborn.com slash Steve. You're going to get pictures and stories of the lives you've helped to rescue when you go to preborn.com slash Steve and donate today. All right. We can do uh, rapid fire or maybe park it at this one. This is from Jill Orr. Can you expand more about the message God conveyed to you about needing apostles and not assassins? Does that apply to no longer calling for Nuremberg like trials and and like consequences? Because that would be seeking justice. Or was that a message to all of us via God speaking through you as to what our approach should be in making an argument to reach those who are reachable? Great question. No. What went on at Nuremberg one was the exact carrying out of justice that was deserved. And that's exactly why we need a Nuremberg too. And now the people that did this to us are out lying and gaslighting, claiming that, as Aaron pointed out in his montage, claiming that they didn't do what they did. This is just truly demonic. It's been demonic all along. An example should be made. The greatest generation made an example at Nuremberg, and that example stood for about 70 years, but most of those people are dead now. And now we have a new generation that requires that example to be made. Where apostles and not assassins probably comes into this conversation is allowing my desire for justice to get to the point that I start fetishizing the, uh, the practice of it. Does that make sense? Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, guys, I'm not kidding you. I, I mean, I was having dreams about hanging these people myself. I mean, I was literally fantasizing about kicking the chair out from underneath people. And that is a solemn act. It's, it's not a fetish. It's a, it's a solemn act. It is the They fetishized it in the French Revolution. And that's how they got a reign of terror. So there's there's the difference between fetishizing the acts of justice themselves to having a zealous, righteous desire for that justice to take place. And I think in this case, that's the difference between being an apostle and an assassin. Anybody want to add to that? It's a, a couple. I saw a couple people uh, this weekend. Fans of the show came up to me and said, "Can't wait till you're back." Hope Steve is well. And they about asked me like, "What? Do, so what do you think this uh, means for the show?" And I told them honestly, I did not know because th- th- how this was a personal work on a guy named Steve and then how much that Venn diagram, how much does that carry over into the work of the show? I I said, even if I'm, even if Steve was the one right here, I don't think he fully knows yet. You're finding it out right now as you went to the mic for the first time. Yep. 
it's the the first thing it's it's not a question of i'm we christianity is not behavior modification so it's not a question of let me in my own power try to do what is right and then my heart will follow it's the other way around out of the heart the mouth speaks it is not it, it's 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 you know not what's on the outside of a cup that taints you but what's on the inside so first you deal with the heart and then the behavior changes john 317